Hello everyone and welcome to MT's webinar on robotics and automation, practical and affordable steps. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today. I'm Neil Smith, Head of Manufacturing Support Services or MSS and I will be chairing the webinar. The MSS is the customer facing arm of the Manufacturing Technology Centre, MTC, reaching out to manufacturers to understand their challenges and using the expertise of the MTC to solve these. We'll be running a short video at the end of the webinar summarizing this. <clears throat> but before we start, I would like to run through some housekeeping with you. First of all, can I remind you that the session has been recorded so it can be viewed at a later date on the MTC YouTube channel. So you can revisit the content or share with colleagues. Details of this and other information relevant to the webinar will be shared with you in a follow-up email after this event. For the purpose of the webinar, you, the audience, will be in listening mode only, with videos and mics turned off. Your viewing options can be adjusted by clicking on the View Options tab, which is positioned at the top of your screen. Using the drop-down menu, you can either show or hide the video panel. During the webinar, we will be inviting you to ask questions in the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be answered by our speakers at specific intervals during the webinar. We will try to answer as many as possible, but due to time constraints, we may have to be selective. If using the chat function, please note that our comments will be visible for everyone to see. And please share anything on social media if you wish. So in today's webinar, which we expect to last about 45 minutes, we have two speakers, Phil Jackson and Tom Rook. Phil Jackson is a technical specialist for the MTC's Intelligent Automation Group. Phil has enjoyed a career working in startup ventures to global blue chip corporations, in which time he's applied his skill set to developing many complex automated systems across ind industrial sectors, such as biotech systems for waterborne pathogen detection and sensor technology for automotive condition monitoring. Phil has enjoyed many years of running large, complex industrial research projects, building business cases, and overseeing the implementation of new techniques and technologies. Phil has been with the MTC for seven years and has most recently delivered MTC's factory in a box development. Moving over to Tom Rook, Tom started life as an apprentice toolmaker, gained experience in designing software to produce jigs and fixturing for robot welders. CNC machine centers and manual welding. As a design office manager in the mechanical handling industry for five years, Tom's working knowledge of problem solving and designing innovative solutions covered a diverse range of products and sectors, from food to nuclear. Tom later moved into and specialized in robotics and automation, predominantly in the automotive industry. Tom now applies his expertise in driving automation adoption within UK manufacturing in his current role as a project leader in business transformation at the Manufacturing Technology Centre. Moving on. Okay, so today's webinar, which is titled Robotics and Automation, Practical and Affordable Steps, where we want to help you to think about where and when to automate, the benefits of automation, de-risking your investment and consideration for implementation into the working environment. The two presentations will follow a brief introduction to the MTC and catapult centers. Finally, we will bring you to up to date with the current MTC COVID-19 webinar program and support, contact details, and finish with a brief video of the Manufacturing Support Service and our support offer and an exit poll. So the first uh, presentation will be Phil Jackson and will, it will give an uh, insight into the UK uh, robotics scene and then followed by practical and affordable stats uh, with Tom Rook. Next slide, please. The MTC are one of the seven high value manufacturing catapult centers supporting British manufacturing, helping them become more competitive on the global market. We're based near Coventry. We have over 800 employees, of which over 500 are engineers. We help manufacturers with productivity, technology, and innovation across all industries and sectors. When working with SMEs, we can also offer reach match funding support. On site, we have an extensive workshop facility, 
where we can demonstrate cutting edge technologies. We are also the National Centre for Additive Manufacturing. The MTC can help you de-risk and accelerate investment in new technology. I will now hand over to Phil Jackson to begin his presentation. Oh, thank you, Neil. Um, as Neil already mentioned, I'm Phil Jackson. I'm the <coughs> technical specialist for robotics and autonomous systems at the MTC. And I just want to give you a little bit of uh, context, a bit of insight into the situation um, vis-a-vis robotics and automation adopt. We think the blockers are and uh, strategies to make them go away. So moving on to my next slide. I'd like to kick off, um, as every good presentation will, with some statistics. This just gives you some idea of where we are on the international stage in terms of adopting automation systems. So these are numbers of operational six axis robots out there in the market. Granted, it doesn't cover special purpose machines or um, smart tooling or anything like that, but it's, it's a pretty good indicator. Now, some of those territories aren't gonna surprise you. Obviously, China and the USA are right at the top of the ranking, but they're much bigger territories. Um, I just want you to quickly um, bear in mind the proportion of operational units in China before we move on to the next slide, because that, there is an interesting point to make there. Some of these places I say won't surprise you, but some might. I mean, there are territories of very similar sizes, if not smaller, that have done better at adopting automation than we have. And I want to address the question of why that is, why that is, and, and how, we can, how we can make an improvement, and also why we think better adoption of automation is a positive thing. I'll move on to the next slide. The next slide helps us to kind of normalize the statistics a little bit. So this isn't the total number of robots in the territory. This is robots per 10,000 manufacturing employees. And you know, I asked you to look at China before, which is of course an, an international manufacturing powerhouse now. They're only just slightly above us in terms of actual robots in operation per 10,000 employees, which goes to show you just how big the whole operation is. And once again, we've slipped from the last slide uh, where we were at 11th place to 18th when you normalize it. So the picture actually gets slightly worse. Why does this matter? Moving on to the next slide. It matters because every single country that's got a higher manufacturing GBA than us employs more robots per 10,000 people. There is an exception. That exception is India, but they are, they're, they're, they are transforming rapidly. They have a strategy and they're sticking to it. They still have an awful lot of manumatic production operation out there. But there is strong evidence to show that automation robotics results in higher GVA, results in higher productivity. We are, by the way, still a serious competitor on the manufacturing world stage. I'll move on to the next slide. So why is it that this is happening? Why aren't, why aren't we investing more? There are some things which are associated with uh, the UK market, the UK situation that are worth considering. Opacity of the automation market, and what do I mean by that? There is a bit of a bootstrap issue here. If you approach automation suppliers and you point to a certain part of your production system and say, I think this isn't good enough, I think it needs automating, the chances are you're gonna get three entirely different solutions, three entirely different quotations, and if you don't have the tools within the organization, which is to say the experience, to make a determination about which one of those quotations, which one of those solutions is actually going to deliver value for you, then you're not in a great place to make a good investment. And currently, the way the market is in the UK, you aren't helped very much, certainly not as compared to the automation market in some of the comparable territories. This leads to risk aversion. Once again, if you don't know what a good investment is going to look like, then it's associated with unknown risks. So that also bubbles into understanding the benefits you can actually get out of the system. Once again, if you're going to make a big investment and automation, well, it, it, is, it is, of course, perceived to be uh, a big investment. It doesn't necessarily have to be, by the way. You can certainly start with relatively modest investments and work up. But you know, once again, unless you can actually make that business case and know what kind of returns you're going to expect, then the risks are too high and, and, and you don't have any foresight of how good that investment actually is, which of course leads to accessing finance. The business case will help you to access finance, whether you've got internal purse string holders or you're looking for external financiers, you'll need that business plan. You'll need to be able to project forward and say, these are all the costs that we're going to expect, but these are all the returns that we're going to expect as well. And then, of course, 
there's that last issue, which is actually being able to embrace that technology when it lands on the shop floor. Um, having, having the skills, having the understanding, um, having the culture to be able to adopt the stuff and look after it so it remains productive on an ongoing basis. I'll move on to the next slide. So I want to go a little bit further into that. And this is from the uh, time generated experience of, of myself and colleagues like Tom. Why does adoption of automation fail? Why is there a perception that the risk is too high? Um, and maybe, you know, if there are pitfalls, how do we avoid them? Well, the first one is that there's an incorrect analysis of the task to be automated. That's pretty classic. So if you were to just point at a particular part of a production system and say, well, I want to put automation or robotics in there without doing a proper task breakdown and really understanding what all of your uh, KPIs are, and there's a very good chance that what you're going to end up purchasing from the market is a generic solution that may have been applied to other things before, it's been developed, it's there, and you'll buy it, you'll onboard it, and it won't actually achieve what you need it to achieve because you haven't done an analysis about really what it is that you're trying to achieve. Have you broken down the task? Have you taken a product's eye view of exactly what you need to do to that thing in order to put value in? Do you understand um, what your market's gonna do in the next sort of five years? Uh, how flexible does the system have to be? All of these things are incredibly important to getting it right. Uh, incorrect or insufficient calculation of the cost and returns, and that's largely associated. You know, obviously you can't make a business case unless you understand all of these things well. Bad specification of equipment, just a little one on that. Of course you have to understand what you're trying to achieve. But then, of course, you have to be able to communicate that as well. There are two sides to this. There's the fact that you've effectively communicated what it is that you're trying to achieve in order to be able to form a contract with the person that's going to supply it to you. But the other side to it as well is making absolutely sure that, A, your specification is a good one. B, your specification is completely understood. There is no such thing as a perfect specification. That's important. And then, of course, these things can be... Uh, can, can result in the delivery of an ineffective solution. Uh, the number of times uh, that I've seen what are effectively white elephant projects in factories, it's a little heartbreaking actually. Somebody has onboarded a, a, an industrial robot, they, they bought in a piece of equipment, uh, which ends up gathering dust and returning no value, or just um, holding things up for, or showing itself to be ineffective enough just to be taken off at some stage. Um, it's, it's a real shame. And then of course there's unanticipated changes to product demand. So if those things haven't been mapped out and you don't know to what extent your equipment has to be flexible to deal with uh, future changes in your output, then you've got a good chance of unfortunately uh, losing out on your investment. I made a point there, I like this picture because it's particularly stupid, but um, yeah, this is the point. Dropping automation into your unprepared work area, it's unlikely result in success there are a whole load of things that you need to work through first and in fact I would suggest that specifying and purchasing the equipment is one of the last things you have to do there are lots of other things to consider first I'll move on to the next slide um, I'm, I'm just going to make well actually um, another tortuous analogy but it's an important one to remember so I mentioned before, just pointing to something on the production line that seems not to be as effective as you'd like it to be, or something that you'd like to automate, and then saying, we'll buy a piece of equipment to, uh, to augment that, to make things better. Well, if you just do that, if you just observe something, for example, a person is doing the thing, robot in there, moving on to the next slide. Well, this can lead to um, an unfortunate and inappropriate deployment of technology. We call this SpongeBob. It's obvious. Um, to anybody with any industrial experience that washing a car with an industrial robot like this um, is an incredibly expensive and inefficient way of doing it. And yet, we do see the equivalent of this out there quite a lot, uh, I'm sad to say. Now, obviously, if you've understood the task and you've broken it down, uh, you know what kind of throughput of, in this case, cars you need, um, and um, you have a, a good understanding of all the things that have to interact with that car, moving on to the next slide, you're going to end up with a completely different solution. Something like that, something we've all seen. And that, in this context, is a special purpose machine. So there's a decision point to be made there once you've really understood what you're trying to achieve. 
is the business case going to be powered by a special purpose machine? Does that investment make sense? Is, is, have you got a, a throughput situation that requires that? Do you need the flexibility of an industrial robot? Maybe actually the best solution is to give people smart tools and augment the work of the, of the humans. Once again, if you haven't calculated this, you wouldn't know. And the good news is there are established tools, templates, and methods for doing it. Moving on to the next slide. So just before I finish off, I just wanted to labor the point again. There are so many different parts of your business that are going to be affected by this. And there are so many different parts of your business that need to be prepared. So the first thing you have to do on the far left of this diagram, work out what your aspirations are. Yeah? Do you have particular um, quality requirements? What's the product mix going to be like? Uh, the, the, the volume, do you have cost targets? All of those things. Let's really, really understand um, holistically what your pr production system has to do. What you're trying to avoid here is what I call a sticking plaster automation. Stick a piece of equipment in the production system because something's getting old on the basis that you sort of, you've reacted to the fact that, that it becomes apparent something has to improve. Instead of looking at the whole production system and saying, let's, let's really deconstruct this, let's really understand what it's trying to achieve. When you've understood all of those metrics and all of the aspirations, obviously a concept's important. And once again, it could be smart tools, robots. You might need AGVs, it might be a special purpose machine. We can calculate business models behind all of these things and work out what's the most appropriate. And obviously once you've done that, your costs and revenues can be evaluated. We can make a business plan. You can understand exactly what your position is financially and what your investment looks like. And then you're in a position to adjust business functions. Whether it's the culture to be able to look after the equipment on an ongoing basis, or indeed be able to spot opportunities in the future as well for new automation, because that's also important. So many other things are going to be are going to be affected and need to be adjusted to make good use of it. And once you've done that, the last point, road mapping. What do I mean by that? It's planning. You're going to implement an automation milestone in the next couple of months, maybe. Uh, well, where do we go from there? What kind of IT infrastructure are we going to need from that point on? What sort of uh, training are we going to need from that point on? What does the future look like? And how are we going to keep driving um, increased productivity through the use of technology? So that's my last slide. And now I'm going to hand back to Neil because we have a little bit of time for a QA before we move on. Okay, thank you, Phil. That was a great presentation. Um, I like your collection of cars. Uh, we must be paying you too much. Um, right, we've had no uh, questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, so I've got a few of my own that I would like to ask you, Phil, if you yeah. don't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're in the current uh, crisis of COVID-19. How do you th think that will affect uh, people's views on automating in the future? Actually, of course, the, the current situation has been incredibly disruptive, but um, what it has done is given people a, a chance to reflect. And there are uh, a lot of different businesses out, out there. The word is on the street um, that, uh, that um, uh, people are starting to consider uh, the adoption of auto automation and robotics much more seriously and much more urgently than before. Think about things like agriculture, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been so badly affected by... Uh, actually not just covid but other other political issues at the moment um and and it, it's one of those sets of circumstances that's really necessitating the thought process necessitating sort of innovation um so if anything um although there's there's clearly going to be a lot of short, short term disruption uh, longer term um it seems that this is actually going to be a catalyst for increased uptake in um technology yeah so do you, i mean there's really viable options out there for automation say Picking strawberries, for example. Do you think that could be? Uh, immediately, I'm going to say uh, if no, if the um, uh, if the notion is that we're just going to send something out like a like a humanoid robot out into the fields, uh, the technology isn't there yet. Uh, however, um, when you start to constrain that problem a little bit, uh, and you look at um, controlling um, elements of, of of that system, like uh, for example, having grow tents with rails in them that robots can travel up and down. There is, in fact, mm -hmm. a lot of really, really interesting development there. And okay. uh, I anticipate within the next relatively short term, the next few years, uh, up to five, we are going to start to see um, some, some legitimately productive systems that, that, that will return value in that kind of um, application. Okay, thank you for that. I've had a question from the audience, uh, Phil. 
Um, the question is, uh, well, it's a comment first of all. Automation is my favorite subject and my greatest frustration. Failed automation for me can actually be evaluated as, as a success. For me, at least indicates the client is determined there is a benefit implementing solution. But how do we get more companies to look at automation as a positive investment? There is still tremendous resistance to change. I completely agree with you. So, um, as I think I mentioned before, we've we've got a bit of a bootstrap issue, which is to say that um, it, if you are a small business owner, and in the UK there's there's a very heavy skew of manufacturing towards SME and mid cap, you know that sort of the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it's very very difficult if there aren't exemplars out there for you to for you to look out to uh, for you know people who are doing similar things to you who have successfully adopted the automation. So our strategy is to be to to try and um, get into um, as many SMEs as possible, and try and transform their world to create exemplars so that people can look across and say, actually, that's yeah, that is possible. That's not yeah. uh, that's not speculative. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the, the other thing is as well, and this is a part of the MTC's mission, to help to reduce that adoption risk. So. Um, if it's if it's helping to create a business plan or, or the concepts or uh, put put together a proper sort of roadmap for for, for, for going forward, yeah. Uh, so that you can assure the financiers that's um, that that that's something that we offer um, on the basis that it's it's a it's a blocker that we want to get rid of. Yeah, looking at lowering the barriers, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got another question here for you, Phil. Um, it's how can we reduce the opacity of the automation market in the UK? Reference your previous slide. Would training education at school level, et cetera, be something that we could introduce? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, there's a couple of things I would suggest. Um, training is, of course, important, and that's one way around. Uh, the other way around is I, 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 I would like um, to, well, I say I would like to, we have started to encourage the automation providers to start to take more of an interest in the, in the, the business plan, the business model as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, so that um, you're not just you're not just buying a solution without any numbers behind it. They're actually saying, well, if you we we've calculated this whole thing, and if if you get it, this is what we suggest. This is what we're projecting forward. Um, and of course, you know, there has to be an education piece as well um, for the for the people who are adopting the automation, so yeah. that they can they can evaluate that on its merits as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, uh, one final question before we move on to Tom. Um, to what extent do you consider automation of condition monitoring, i.e. measurement of vibration of equipment to predict failure? Oh, to, sorry, to what extent do we consider it in general? Um, yeah, well, consider automation of condition monitoring. So, for example, measuring vibration of equipment to predict yeah, failure. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, that, that's becoming increasingly important. So if you, if, you, if you consider a production system whereby... So, I've got slides on this. Um, I'm not going to put them up. Um, th there's, there's, let's say, scenario number one, where a person is putting value into a thing with their hands, and, and they may have some equipment about them. Uh, and they're, 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 there's a very low level of automation. Condition monitoring may return a little value, but not an awful lot. It, 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 it's very dependent on um, uh, the um, various different factors con concerning the, the sort of the the uptime of the machine they're quite uptime of the machine but as as you move the person a layer of abstraction away from putting value in with their hands and you mm -hmm. need a high level of automation and you've got more machines interacting with each other stuff like conditioning monitoring and understanding especially when it's you know this 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 prognostic condition monitoring type technology it starts yeah. to become incredibly valuable mm -hmm. you know every if you're aware of um uh, the condition of every cog in in the chain in your system, kind of thing, and yeah. you predict accurately when one's going to one needs replacement. Um, mm -hmm. you, you've got a really powerful tool for for keeping value running through. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's fantastic stuff. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, and thank you to the audience for those questions. Uh, that's all we've got time for. Will you join us later, Phil, for question and answer? I'm delighted to. Yes, thanks. Okay. All right. So I'm now going to introduce Tom Rook. Uh, presenting his uh, topic of practical and affordable steps. Over to you then, Tom. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Phil. And hello, everyone. So, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So, I'd like to cover in some more detail some of the points raised in Phil's slides. So, this will only be an overview, unfortunately, given the time involved, but I'll try and give as much detail on the important aspects of adopting automation. So, the things I'll be covering will be 
affordable steps you can take within your business, overviews of different levels of automation, some examples of working with MTC clients, and then just to recap some key steps to safely adopt automation. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you can see a diagram that is, is commonly used in the MTC to support SMEs in adopting automation. You may notice this is central about a business case. And firstly, we need to assess the current state of the identified process for automation. Once we've understood that, we need to understand then the company's goals. And quite often to achieve these goals, it is necessary to take a phased approach to this end solution. I've highlighted six key areas on the right hand side that I'd like to cover in a bit more detail with you. So firstly, process. Identifying opportunities within your own manufacturing processes which could help you adopt automation. For instance, accuracy of components may result, a higher accuracy of the components may result in a, in a less complex and, a, and a costly solution. If your processes are repeatable, this could absolutely complement automation and the volume of products you have flowing through that process will reduce the machine downtime for changeovers. Number two, business case. A localised business case for the identified process will indicate the benefits that the automation will bring. It's important to use a relevant true data for this exercise and if this isn't done correctly it could compromise the return on the investment. Number three, selecting the of automation. Ensure that you select the correct level of automation to suit the business case. There are many types to choose from and I will cover this in my next slide. Number four, evaluate the impact of the automation. This falls into a, a couple of different areas. Uh, it could be the staff and culture. Sometimes just the, the, the mere talk of automation can be unsettling for a workforce. So it, it's quite key to, to communicate with them. The factory flow and layout, as Phil has alluded to in his slides, we have seen many scenarios where people have dropped automation into their shop floor and it just hasn't worked as they haven't realized and understood the impact that automation will have, i.e. it could create bottlenecks, it could slow up process. So you need to really understand the impact that the automation is gonna, is gonna bring. Uh, number five, preparing an RFQ is arguably the most important element to adopting automation. I've seen mid-cap mid sized businesses fall down in this area. The RFQ, the request for quotation, is really the specification and it denotes where, the, where you would like the automation to start and stop. And if this isn't specific enough, the integrator may make assumptions which could bring associated risks. A lack of clarity within an RFQ will result in a solution failing to meet the business needs. And number six, where to, where to buy the automation. It's important to work with the appropriate size of integrator. Too large or too small an integrator may lead to delays or lack of support. Next slide, please. So in this slide, I just want to cover some different types of automation that could be viable for your application. Uh, second-hand robots. So some companies opt for a second-hand robot as, as this can offer a more affordable way into automation. But exercising caution in this area is advised due to some issues listed out here. So the age of the robot. Post-2006 models will have a newer safety compliant technology which is easy to install. The condition of the robot. Signs of collisions may indicate the robot has been mistreated which in the impact on the repeatability and the accuracy of the unit and support. Parts and servicing could be problematic due to obsolete parts for older robots and these only being available on the second hand market if at all. So some considerations there. Collaborative robots. Now these are designed for direct human interaction in a shared space and the reach and payload of these units can be restricted in comparison to their industrial counterparts. Typically, they're commonly used in, in more clean environments and may not fare so well in more challenging environments such as foundries. Safety in and around collaborative robot systems is still a bit of a gray area, unfortunately. From a directive level, the company has to ensure 
they have done their due diligence to make the system safe for use. This is done by being compliant with both ISO 10218 1 and 2. The safety may rely on speed and force or sensors and software that ensure safe behavior. But you need to look at which, which solution is most viable for your application. Industrial robots. Now, some integrators may default to manufacturers they are most familiar with, and that's not always the most cost effective solution, and it could be an over engineered solution. It may be an option to free issue robots to the integrator. This will allow you to shop around different manufacturers, which may bring cost savings. It's quite a competitive marketplace and it, it could bring some benefits in, in, and we do quite see that more common, commonplace in, in the industry now. Which one? There are many different types of robots. Often people will default to a six-axis robot. However, less costly robots may be more suitable for your application, such as a four or five-axis robot. An environment. Different robots are designed to suit different environments, such as foundry spec robots, high accuracy robots, sterile environment robots, and high speed robots. So really it's, it's having a look in the, do some market research, see which is the best suitable robot for your application, your environment. Uh, moving over to other types of automation, this is quite an interesting one. It's, it's really important to consider this, this element. Uh, there are many different types of company that, that offer um, special purpose or specialized equipment that people might not even be aware of. Uh, MTC and other catapults will have knowledge of this uh, and we can advise. But it is, a, it is definitely worth considering the other types of automation. A semi-automated assisted solution may be more suitable than a fully automated solution. Sometimes having a human there is just needed. Uh, SpongeBot, referring to Phil's slide, uh, it isn't always the best solution to have a robot in every application. Many companies could offer special purpose solutions which could be more, which be more suited for your application. Next slide, please. So to give you an example of some clients we've worked with, there was a client in particular in the construction sector, and this is a typical case of an RFQ not being prepared correctly. So this company, we worked with or did a special purpose machine, which when installed didn't meet the throughput requirements. It hadn't been detailed enough in the, in the, in the RFQ. The reason why they couldn't load the raw material into the machine efficiently is there was too much variance in the product. And as a result, the machine wasn't meeting the, the throughput that it was required and they were using a forklift truck with three or more operatives which was a dangerous, costly, and very unproductive way of, way of working. So the workforce and the management team concluded that the remedy to the, issue, to the issue, they required a robot to load the machine. They engaged with the MTC and asked us to create some concepts for a solution. But shortly after in the initial engagement with them, we realized that robotics was not the solution and a semi-automated solution was needed to allow for the variance in the product, so we needed a human there. This was an efficient solution, but only one operative was needed and the throughput requirement was then met. This actually resulted in a fraction of the cost of what they budgeted for a robotic solution. So as you could imagine, it, it was a very, very happy client. Next slide, please. Another company we worked with was a, an aluminium die cast company uh, based in, in Andover, and they were looking at a machine tending solution. They had optimized their current process. Uh, they purchased a number of uh, vertical milling centers, and they wanted to understand the benefits automation would bring. Uh, they were running out of room to grow. So they were looking at automation. So, so we reviewed their range of parts to identify which of the parts were, were best suited for automation. And once we identified, we produced a business case to highlight the benefits that automation would bring, which resulted in a 40% in a, in a increase in machine availability. So this was very appealing to, to the company. The return on investment was also, also very healthy due to the, the, the staff skill level. Uh, and the opportunities that the automation would bring would be obviously more available machine time, improved lead times on their, on their, through their customers, the ability to take more work on, 
and increase profitability to buy more, more automation, upskill their staff and grow. So we looked at three concepts for, for this company. Um, we produced a, a, a concept with a collaborative robot with some bin picking technology. So operatives could still work in and around the area with tasks that were required. We used uh, another concept with a, uh, an industrial robot with a similar bin picking technology, fully guarded. And then we looked at some turnkey solutions, which we thought would be viable for them. After looking at the, uh, the criteria, the company uh, wanted us to score these against each other. It was evident that a turnkey solution would have been more viable for them. It was a high investment, but due to the, the, the healthy ROI, that wasn't an issue. There was, these are already out there in the marketplace, so we could go to other foundries and expose the company to, to this technology. Uh, it, it gave them a more of a level of comfort. It was de-risked, debugged. They were, you know, it's pretty much ready to go. So this is what he opted for. We then looked at spawning and end effectors for the robot on a separate project to reduce the need for changeovers and, and, and further machine downtime. As you can see in the imagery there, we actually printed some of the uh, grippers for him to, um, to de-risk before we actually had them hard tooled. Next slide, please. So just to recap on the key criteria to adopt automation, prepare a solid business case for the application intended. Determine the right level of automation around that business case and prepare a robust specification to go out to tender with. Once this is done and you know where to go and buy, which integrators are right for you, the MTC and any other catapult center will offer unbiased advice to support these steps. And once these are done correctly, you are ready to adopt automation. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you for that Tom, great presentation. Um, are you ready to join as well, Phil, if you have any questions? Indeed, I'm here, yeah. Okay, we've got the full team. That's great. Okay, we've had a couple of questions from the audience. So um, I'm not sure who this one's to really, but I'll ask it and you can uh, decide. Uh, the question is, how difficult is it to still get a universal single platform for different robots and digital machines? <laughs> who wants to take that one <laughs> i'm going to say i'm going to say very i don't know if tom wants to elucidate on that but um uh, i i presume what you're what you're talking about is sort of plug and play into con connectivity between uh robots from different vendors and bits of production equipment from di different ven vendors um if, if if that interpretation what the, yeah yeah um yeah. this is interconnectivity between different generations of production hardware is like a perennial problem mm -hmm. uh, that's very difficult to crack and it, and um the the reality of any any production site that's been around for any longer than sort of 10 years is that you're going to have uh, different machines from different vendors with different interfaces um uh, different nuances. Th th sorry and different nuances for each process uh, yeah yeah indeed indeed um uh, there, there are solutions. Uh, there are solutions out there. I'm not going to name any particular products. Uh, software products that are designed to try and pull things together. Um, there are a few uh, communications protocols uh, interfaces out there as well, which are starting to mm -hmm. come into more common use. Uh, yeah. And so it's it's getting it's getting easier, but there's no that there's no there's no single there's, there's no single solution to it. No, so okay, I understand. Um, okay, I'm going to ask this question to uh, Tom. Yeah. Um, the question is, does the machinery directive apply to the pre-used robot market? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the machine directive doesn't really um, care if it's a pre-used robot or not. You, you've got yeah. to apply that, that same directive around any robotic cell. Now, with some older robots, they operate on a single uh, uh, channel safeties, and you have to start hardwiring safety or by you know putting banks of IO on on robots, uh, it becomes very convoluted to get CE marked. And to be honest, with you, most integrators probably wouldn't want to take that kind of work on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, another question that's coming from the audience: uh, What's the um, typical length of time uh, for an automation project? For example, uh, machine tending. As in. For an integrator or for, net, for support from an, an NTC organization? 
I think really it's, it's, it's for the whole project. So the, the, the SME is obviously looking for support from the MTC to, to come up to, to the concept and then it's going to hand over to an integrator. How, what's the sort of time period before, you know, first of all, picking the phone up and ringing the MTC and then actually getting the automation cell working in his production line what what, what would you think um, i mean it really depends on the scale of of, of it but machine tending is quite a, quite a proven you know application you the the, the project within the within the mtc would be around four to six weeks and then yeah. with an integrator then hopefully a lot of the a lot of the legwork's done it's a case you can go to the integrator with a robust specification and some idea of what it's going to look like and then really it's just the availability of, of the equipment that's involved in that cell but you, know, you should be lucky three months yeah three four months okay. all right as an and, uh, thank you tom uh, and um we've been talking about practical and affordable steps so obviously cost is coming to this tom uh and um a couple of questions from me on this first of all you showed a um a cell where you've got different pieces of equipment you might have a vision system your robot um you've got guarding you've got the actual machine you're loading and unloading and, and you've obviously got to integrate that all together. Yeah. It sounds quite expensive to me. So, you know, what's, what, what we're looking at, you know, entry level possibly costs to a full blown, you know, uh, automate, automated cell. Um, again, it depends. There's lots of different solutions there. There's some robots now that are quite competitively priced and then there's some premium robot manufacturers. Mm -hmm. uh, really, the only thing I could answer on this, Neil, is if you do, the, the, the homework and if, if for example your your solution is costed at 120,000 pounds if you go into that 120,000 pounds without actually done the the precursory work for that the request for quotation the business case to identify the right parts that mm -hmm. could be 120,000 pounds investment that falls over yeah if, oh, okay. if you if you spend a bit of extra money before you engage with the integrators yeah to, to actually define what it is you want that 125 mm -hmm. grand will then become a good investment and, and give a healthy return. But it, it, I mean, typically machine tending, it depends on the, the parts and the actual process involved. As I alluded to mm -hmm. on, on the slide, but the, um, if you've got to start employing secondary equipment to, to, to support the, the solution then the complexity and the cost of that will go up. Okay. And we've got time for one more question, uh, Tom. Um, yep. Oh, maybe uh, maybe Phil might want to get involved with this one as well. As uh, well, are there any particular sectors or supply chains which are really behind the curve with regard to adopt adoption of automation, and where more focus need to encourage them to engage? Is that more for you, Phil? Do you think? Well, I didn't. <laughs> I <beg your> <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it may well be. Um, uh, obviously, uh, there, there are some there are some sectors out there which uh, which have um, really embraced it primarily because they've had to. And we, you know, we, we think of automotive in in that regard. Um, if if you look at, I think I mentioned um, agriculture earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's one that's it's becoming very very evident that uh, you know more work's needed. Um, uh, we're also doing a lot of work at the moment with construction as well. Uh, uh, I think all of these things that I'd mentioned, um, one of the reasons that the, the uh, adoption has been slow, uh, one of one of maybe a few reasons, is that um, the, it, the 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 circumstances around which you you need to implement automation are particularly sort of challenging, which is to say there aren't generic solutions that you can apply to them. Mm -hmm. And so, so the perception yeah. of risk or, well, the actual risk in some cases is higher. Yeah. So talking about unstructured environments, a lot of uh, change to the product, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, high levels of dexterous manipulation required, all those sorts of things, um, you tend to be at the moment m more manual kind of artisan type, um, uh, in industry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Phil. Well, thank you um, both for your uh, presentations. And we'll move on now to the uh, concluding part of the uh, webinar. So how's the MTC um, supporting man manufacturers through the COVID-19 crisis? Well, um, unfortunately, that's the, uh, that's the end of our webinar program. So uh, 
if anybody's looking for a webinar host, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm your man, so I'm looking for a job. So, uh, but if you do want to catch up on the, uh, on the previous webinars, we've, we've done ones on leading from a distance, how to apply digital tools, supply chain business not as usual, how to assess the, your vulnerability in your supply chain, uh, your resilience and robustness, how to uh, maintain productivity in a COVID-19 environment, advice for social distancing, uh, respecting the government guidelines and, and utilizing technology to ensure this. And um, again, today's uh, presentation on robotics and automation will be available on the YouTube as well. Uh, we are also offering a 30 minute conference call with one of our senior advisors. If you've got any particular challenges either on today's webinar or on, on any manufacturing uh, problem or issue you've got. You can book that by emailing the MSS at the dash mtc.org. And we also have on the next slide, uh, another webinar taking place, uh, our Liverpool office DMA launch event, supply chain engagement on Thursday the 9th of July at 11 o'clock, lasting for an hour. Okay, we're gonna move on now to the uh, final uh, video, please, thank you. We can deliver value to businesses quickly. Working with clients, strength our businesses. Using their challenges and the technology that's right for them. 50 million pounds worth of the latest manufacturing technology. Fresh thinking that you could not access any other way. Doing things out of the ordinary is not out of the ordinary for us. Working with MTC has been fantastic. I believe this is a smart approach to business. We've turned over 30% more orders. We actually haven't employed anybody else. We've managed to double our turnover in a period of two years without increasing increasing our overhead costs. We focus on helping great British manufacturing get even better. Okay, thank you for listening today. If you need to contact us, MSS at the uh, dash mtc.org and don't forget the depot. Thank you again. See you soon. Bye bye.